When it comes to things that math nerds love, smelling math books, proofs, and prime numbers have got to be in the top five. And today we're talking about two of three of these beloved things by taking a look at this beautiful one-line proof of an ancient truth. First, we'll get a little bit of context to make sure we understand the proof, and then we'll jump into a quick discussion to explain how this one line proves there are infinitely many primes. Prime numbers, being integers greater than one with only two factors, have fascinated mathematicians since antiquity, and anybody thinking about prime numbers for the very first time will eventually arrive at the question, how many primes are there? This most urgent matter was settled around 2,300 years ago, circa 300 BC, by the famous ancient Greek mathematician who didn't have a cult, Euclid. <laughs> Euclid. Yes, he proved that in fact the number of primes is infinite. And good thing, because every integer greater than 1 can be factored into primes. So if we ever ran out of prime numbers, it's hard to imagine we wouldn't eventually run out of numbers completely. And then there'd be no way to count my gummies in Kirby Air Riders. Like many famous results, the infinitude of the primes has been proven time and again. But the one-line proof we're looking at today was dropped in May 2015 by Sam Northshield in volume 122 of the delightful American Mathematical Monthly. Some other cool inclusions in this issue were a one-formula proof of the non-vanishing of L functions of real characters at one, and a mathematical analysis of dark matter. But near the end of the issue, we get North Shield's proof, and to understand it, we need just a few things. These are uppercase pies. If you know how sigma is used in math, this is just sigma, but for multiplication. It tells us to multiply by this expression over and over again for every value of the indexing variable. In this case, that indexing variable p is taken over all primes. So this uppercase pi over here is just the product of all primes. This one over here would look like this if we wrote out the first few terms. It's a product that has a term like this for every prime number p. Of course, you're also going to need a basic understanding of the sine function. If you only know sine as opposite over hypotenuse in a right triangle, that's fine, but we really need the unit circle definition. This is used to define sign for all real numbers, not just acute angles in right triangles. Just pick a point on the unit circle, draw the segment from the origin to this point, then the y value of the point is defined to be the sign of the angle from the x-axis to that segment. At a glance, the y value of this point might not look much like opposite over hypotenuse, but when you draw this perpendicular, you can see that it really is. The hypotenuse is radius one in the unit circle, and this opposite segment is just the vertical distance from the x-axis, which is the y-coordinate. So opposite over hypotenuse, that's y, that's sine of theta. And of course, as a result of this definition, after a full rotation, the sine values will repeat. And what's a full rotation? Well, 360 degrees, or using radians, which is just a better way to measure angles, it's two pi radians. And that means that sine of x plus two pi is the same as sine of x. Remember, inside the sine function is an angle. If we add two pi to an angle, that's just a full rotation. And of course, a full rotation isn't going to change the sine value. Value. We just get back where we started. So sine of x plus 2 pi is sine of x. Of course, by very much the same logic, sine of x plus 2 pi times k is equal to sine of x for any integer k. It doesn't matter how many full rotations we make in the counterclockwise or the clockwise direction, as long as we're making full rotations, then the value's not going to change. And since all the way around the circle is 2 pi radians, halfway around is 1 pi. We could spin around in increments of pi. Pi, 2 pi, 
3 pi, 4 pi, always landing on the x-axis where sine is zero. Of course, a quarter way around is half of that, so that's pi over two. Pi over three would look something like that, and pi over four would just cut this quadrant in half. If we continue to divide pi by increasing positive numbers, the angles look like this, continuing to live in the first quadrant and approaching the x-axis. The only other fact we need, we already mentioned that every integer greater than one can be factored into primes. Now the one-line proof will be a breeze to understand. But yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying, I know, that's not a one-line proof, that's two lines clickbait clickbait bad math youtuber bad all right we begin by assuming that the set of primes is finite and we're going to show this leads to a contradiction the first inequality is that zero is less than the product of sine of pi over p for all primes p this is true because for starters this is a finite product because we're assuming there are finitely many primes, so it's some defined number, and we know that every number in this product is positive. Remember, we were just discussing how all of those angles, pi divided by a positive number, they all live in here between pi over two and then this is zero. So they're all somewhere in here where the y values, and hence the sine values, are positive. These are all angles greater than no rotation at all, but less than or equal to a quarter rotation. So all of these sine values for sure are positive, thus the product is greater than zero. Then this product is equal to this one. And how do we know that? What's going on here? Well, remember we can add even multiples of pi inside the sine function without changing the value. So certainly sine of pi over p is the same as sine of pi over p plus two pi times k for any integer k. And if we go ahead and distribute the pi in this expression, we'll see that it's really the exact same sort of thing. Distributing the pi, this expression within the product becomes sine of pi times one over p. So that's sine of pi over p and then plus this over p times pi. So we'll write that as plus two pi times this product of all the prime numbers all over p. And notice how this inner product is using a different variable. It has p prime, whereas the outer product has p. The outer product is a product of these sine functions. And every single one of those sine functions for each prime number p has this entire product contained within it. So in each sine function, p is taking on the value of a different prime number, but within each individual sine function, the p primes are all getting multiplied together and they're ranging over every possible prime number. And that's how we know this works. We understand we can add any multiple of two pi inside the sine function and its value won't change. But how do we know this is an integer multiple of two pi? After all, there's division by a prime number p here. Well, like we just said, this is the product of all prime numbers. So whatever prime number p is, it's somewhere in this product. Hence, those will cancel out and leave behind an integer multiple of two pi. Since we're adding an integer multiple of two pi inside the sine function, the value doesn't change. And so for sure, this equality holds. And then the contradiction arrives because this expression is equal to zero. But at the very start of the proof, we said that it was greater than zero. And we know that this expression has to equal zero because it's just a product of a bunch of sine values and we know at least one of the sine values is zero. And to clarify that point, I'm going to rewrite this expression again. So remember, this is a product of this expression, but for every prime number P. So each factor in this product looks like this, sine of all of this stuff, which can be written as sine of pi times all of this stuff. 
So we've just slid the pi out of the fraction to write it like this. And all of this stuff getting multiplied by pi, we know for sure is an integer for some prime number p. And that's because, of course, the top here is an integer greater than one. It's one plus two times the product of all the prime numbers. And remember, every integer greater than one can be factored into primes. So every integer greater than one has some prime factors. It could be that this expression doesn't have two, for example, as a prime factor. So then the first factor in this product, when p takes on the value of two, well, then this would not be an integer. But again, the numerator here does have some prime factor. So eventually, the indexing variable p is going to equal a particular prime that happens to be a factor of the numerator. And when that happens, p will cancel out with that factor in the numerator, and that's gonna leave behind an integer multiple of pi. And what did we say about integer multiples of pi? Well, that's just counting half rotations on the circle. They're all on the x-axis. And so the sign of an integer multiple of pi has to be zero. Hence, at least one term in this product has to be zero. And if even one term in a big product is zero, then of course that forces the whole thing to be zero. And this contradiction establishes the falsehood of our assumption. We defied Euclid and said the set of primes is finite, but now we see that simply can't be so. This proof is cute, but its weaknesses are very apparent to anybody who knows the classic way the proof is typically taught. The typical proof itself is basically one line. It's a real beginner proof, so it might often appear with more explanation than necessary, but regardless, it's very short. More significantly, this proof basically has the typical proof embedded in it right here. The classic proof says, hey, take any finite list of primes, multiply them all together, add one, this number then certainly can't have any of these primes as a factor, and so this list can't be complete. So the classic proof uses prime factorizations to establish this finite list of primes can't be complete, whereas this proof accepts that the list is complete to assert that this number will be divisible by one of the primes and thus delaying the contradiction to the end of the equation with the equals zero. Well, hey, that's a fun little treat to nibble on, isn't it? What do you think about this proof? Let me know in the comments. I hope everybody had a Merry Thanksgiving and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math videos on the internet. I'm not stable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and untucked the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, well, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet. Faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you so, so.